Uh, my name is Jim Dance. I have the distinct privilege and honor, the humble uh, privilege and honor of serving as senior minister here at First Baptist Church. And it is my honor to welcome you to this place tonight. You are about to be gifted with something wonderful. And it's also my honor to welcome you here to this place tonight. Uh, among our staff, we have a mantra, and it is this. We do not do God's work. We simply create a space for God to do God's work. And uh, we've created a space for you tonight. Thank you for being here. And I, I need to answer two questions. I've obviously gotten a lot of phone calls in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> and I thought I would just wait and answer the two primary questions tonight. Uh, the answer to the first question is, no, I'm not gay. <laughs> the answer to the second question, the second question is, why? And uh, Tim, if you don't mind me preaching for just a minute, because I got a house full here. <laughs> uh, my simple question, my simple answer to that each time has been, because I'm a Christian and a follower of Christ. That's why. And uh, Christ, uh, yeah, it's, that's why. Uh, Christ welcomed lepers and women. Christ welcomed Romans and Samaritans. Christ welcomed prostitutes and lawyers. <laughs> the prostitutes we understand, but the lawyers uh, a little harder. In fact, the only people that Jesus never was really comfortable with were self-righteous, judgmental, religious people. And it's... And listen, listen, really. It, it's not that Jesus didn't love those people as much as he loved everyone else in the first century. It's just that they will annoy the hell out of you if you're around them too long. Uh, I am glad that you are here tonight. I am happy that the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus and the Oakland Interfaith Choir are with us tonight. Uh, I heard them rehearse this afternoon. You are going to cry. You are going to laugh. You are going to be inspired. You are going to be bro brought closer to God and closer to other human beings. And if the church does that, and if we do that for one another, that's about the best the church and humanity can do. What, what I really wanted to talk about tonight was a post-Easter story in the Bible. And uh, whether you believe it or not, or that's your faith expression or not, I wanted to share this story with you and talk about how the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus carries the image of God and you are Jesus to so many people, whether you realize it or not. And uh, so if you'll allow me to use those images tonight, I wanted to share this story with you since we're eight days past Easter. And I think you'll see why I think this is an interesting story to share tonight. Um, this particular gospel story says, on the eighth day after the resurrection, which would, today would be the anniversary of that, the disciples were together and Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And he showed them his hands and his side and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. But Thomas, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And when the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, he said to them, well, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side where the spear was, I will not believe. So later when the disciples were together, Thomas was with them. And even though the doors were locked, Jesus appeared and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, okay, put your finger here and touch my hands. Reach out your hand and touch my side and stop doubting and believe. So I want to stop there and first of all, just thank all of you who are on the Lavender Pen Tour for coming to First Baptist Greenville. We still have not recovered from your visit. And if recovery means going back to the way you were before, we don't want to recover uh, because that was a, it was really a life changing, culture changing, ethos changing moment uh, in the life of our church. And I really want to thank those of you who came to Greenville to the Peace Center recently uh, to sing. It was good to see you and get to talk to some of you and hug a few necks. And I miss seeing the rest of you and missed hugging the rest of those necks. 
And speaking of the hugging, as you might guess, the reason I chose this particular Easter story or post-Easter story tonight uh, was I wanted to talk about the power of touch, uh, particularly in this season of our nation's life and your state's life and my state's life, at least until tomorrow, where we have to socially distance ourselves from each other and I will keep socially distancing. Uh, it seems that we are particularly uh, keen on and having a light shined on our need for touch and uh, some sense of intimacy with other human beings. And I'm not gonna wade through all the medical and psychological research associated with touch. You can Google all that up and read about it yourselves. But I think all of you are probably pretty familiar with the studies that they've done with orphaned babies who are born in hospitals, particularly in Europe and Asia and some uh, lower economic areas of the world where these babies are not held and they're not rocked and they're not sang to and they're not coddled and they're not cuddled and snuggled. Uh, the same kind of research has been done with animals who are separated from their litter or adults who've been put in solitary confinement in prison. And when you read these studies, it is not surprising to us at all that every one of them shows some resulting level of emotional and social and psychological and spiritual uh, deficit or harm when we are not touched and are not able to touch. There's something about touch that we all need uh, as a part of this animal kingdom and certainly the human kingdom. And, uh, and we know how important it is. And I, I think one of the reasons I'm drawn to this text, not only because it's the eighth day after Easter and it fits, um, but because I've become extremely aware of this over the last five or six weeks. Uh, I'm probably like some of you, I live alone. Uh, so when you are socially distanced alone and keeping six feet whenever you go anywhere and not able to move in the typical social circles you move in, I have not, I have not touched another human being for a little over six weeks. It's a weird thing to think about. I mean, I have not shaken anyone's hand. I haven't hugged anyone. I haven't walked by anyone in the hallway or a grocery store aisle on the sidewalk and reach out and touch their shoulder or touch their arm. And, and I'm not suffering in any way, and many of you are probably in the same boat, but I am keenly aware of the fact that I have not touched another human being for almost two months now. So it's, it's a really strange uh, space to be in and thing to think about. So jumping back to the, the Lavender Tour, uh, since I've had plenty of time to just sit and watch TV and do read books and do other things, I decided yesterday, since I knew I'd be talking to you tonight, to go back and watch the whole concert from First Baptist Greenville again. I'm so glad that whole concert has been captured and can be seen from start to finish. And, and I watched it again yesterday. And for me, I'll be honest, I was trying to get at the heart of why that event and why that evening and what was it about that moment that was so intense for our congregation? Uh, I, I can't speak for anyone except the people that I bump up against every day for the last couple of years and myself, but I was wondering why was it, why was, why did it have the level of intensity that it did? Now you might say, or I might have said if you had asked me a couple of weeks ago, well, that's because the choir sang and we touched your hearts and we touched your culture and we touched your church. And that's really what we came to do. We came to the South to touch all of these different states and these different communities and these different cultures. And the music and the words and the presence were powerful but because we touched you. And I would say, yeah, that's true. I kind of get it, but that can't be the whole thing. Uh, you did touch us in these ways, but the truth of the matter is, uh, we've been touched by powerful music and good choirs and strong personalities in the past, but it did not have the effect that the Gay Men's Chorus had coming to First Baptist. And what I think I finally figured out, and I'm, you know, I'm not saying that this is, this is the, the grand explanation of all things, but I do think this is true. It's not so much that you touched us with your presence and your music and your voice and your personalities, I think the really powerful moment of the evening is that you allowed us to touch you. Uh, it's the same invitation that Jesus gave to Thomas and the other disciples, touch me. 
It's not just about us coming and singing and touching your heart and touching your culture. You, in, you invited us to touch you. I mean, you could have invited us to listen to one of your albums or invited us to San Francisco or invited us to hear you at a civic center somewhere, and then you would have touched us. The music would have touched us. But when you drove into our parking lot and you got up on our platform in a Baptist church in the South, you made yourself vulnerable and said, touch us. Go, go ahead, touch us. And anytime you invite someone to touch you, there's an automatic vulnerable edge to that. Um, but that's not why you're like Jesus. The reason you're like Jesus is because you took it a step further. And this is what I think was really the impact of that night, reflecting on it and watching the concert yesterday. You didn't just say, touch us. You said, touch our scars, touch our wounds, touch the tender places in our lives that have barely had time to heal. I mean, I don't know if you know that you did that, but you did. I mean, when you walk as a choir into a church, as a gay man's chorus in the South, you allowed us to touch your scars. And it was absolutely evident because you had tears in your eyes, which is the way we feel when somebody else touches our wounds and touches our scars. But it was most evident in the songs that you sang. And I had never thought about this before. I'm sure you have. If you haven't, I'll lay it in front of you. Every song you sang on that set list exposes a wound or a scar that you might carry or someone in the choir carries. You have more friends than you know, truly brave, even the funny ones. If you were gay, she's got you, color out of Colorado, nearer my God to thee, God help the outcast, love can build a bridge, amazing grace. I, I, I don't know if you know that you do this, but you do it. Every time you sing these songs, you lay a wound out, you lay a scar out, you lay a story out and say, this is what we've been through. And it, it, it invites people to touch your scars and your wounds. Um, and I've, I've been carrying this all day. In fact, I recorded a Vesper for our church tonight around the same story. It, it hit me so hard yesterday. Uh, I'm not sure we really ever truly know each other or can love each other until we say, touch my scars, touch my wounds. Um, I know between Tim and I, uh, the first email I got was his Baptist pedigree. Uh, the next time we talked, we talked more about scars and wounds. It was like, look, I've been stabbed in the back before. I've been shaking hands with preachers before and been ushered out the door. And, and it, we started talking about something other than pedigree, it was scars and wounds. Uh, thinking down this road, I thought about Henry Nouwen this week, a Roman Catholic priest who died a few years ago professor, priest, great writer, the, the number one published Roman Catholic author in the world who wrote the book Wounded Healer. And in that book, he said, the way we love one another is through our common pain, through the sharing of our wounds with each other. And uh, if, if you didn't know it, Henry Nouwen was a closeted gay priest his whole life and uh, struggled with the wounds and the scars that had been placed on him by the church. Henry knew the power of touching scars. And I'm, I'm gonna kind of end with this story and then we can chat for a little bit and I'll be happy to answer any question you have. I, I met a young lady at a coffee shop uh, about two years ago now downtown and we were talking and she had this scar on her wrist right near her, where her wrist joins her hand. And I remember asking her, tell me about your scar. And she told me the story around the scar and. When she got finished, I noticed she also had one just above her eyebrow. And I said, I don't, I don't mean to pry, but I said, you've also got a scar above your eyebrow. Is that from the same accident? She said, no, no, that was something else. And she told me, and then she said, you know, I've got to say, these are things that I usually try to hide in my life. And why is a man asking me about scars that I have that are visible? That seems so rude. And uh, I kind of laughed and I said, well, I, I did. I heard this female minister preach once. And uh, I will never forget the line that she said. She said, every stretch mark I have from birthing two children, every scar I have, every wrinkle I have on my face from every smile I've ever made, these tell the story of my life and they are precious to me. 
So Jesus said to Thomas, not just come and touch me, but he said specifically, come and touch my scars. And uh, when I was thinking about that today, I thought, well, that's it. Uh, the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus is Jesus. You are corporately Jesus, whether you want the designation or not because you essentially came to First Baptist Greenville, and I think you do it everywhere you go and sing, and you say, yes, this music is gonna to touch you, but more important than that, we are inviting you to, to touch us, touch our scars, and know, know what life has really been like. And for more than anything else, truly, truly, um, yeah, that's what I wanna thank you for, and thank you for sharing with us. And, I hope that wasn't too much reflection on something that happened two years ago, but I couldn't get away from it today uh, with that being the story of the day or the scripture of the day uh, in my particular faith expression. So I'm going to stop there, Tim or Chris or whoever's running. Oh, boy, oh boy. You. Jim Dant. Uh, I've, told, I've told the guys that, you know, several of us have, have been in church and seen you uh, and heard you give your message and it's it's live streamed and you never cease to amaze me 